the family evicted twice in two years. Learning important lessons from Japan. And Milne Bay community in numbers for Provincial Day. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and a thank you for joining us for Saturday's news. A family at Port Moresby's Gerahu suburb was evicted for the second time in two years. Family members told MTV News their title papers are with the National Housing Corporation with no transfer of land titles to any party. The eviction took place hours after Housing Minister John Cowper announced his stop eviction directive for all NHC properties in Port Moresby yesterday. This amateur footage taken yesterday by residents of Geru 3D. Three police officers seen with an officer of the assumed landlord giving instructions to a bulldozer to demolish three houses belonging to the Heria family. Eyewitnesses say the police officers spoke a particular ethnic language and even threatened the Heria family not to enter the residence. Around 5.30 a.m. this morning, MTV News visited the Herrera family as they woke up outside their home and refuge of nearly 40 years. Margaret Herrera, whose disease father is the title owner of the property, says the land title is also currently the subject of a court proceeding. Triple time, I go to court, magistrate will strike him out or dismiss him. I'll talk to him by challenge the national court. So this case happened last year to the same thing. It happened all rousing me plan, lawyer won't go kiss him. Restraining order and me plan go back inside. The property was occupied by the parents in 1975. Their father passed on in 2008, leaving their mother with three children who are all married with children. Or rousing all parents, mama blow me, want the relatives blow me out, no lock him gate. Next minute, I'm Back up, come them just destroy the whole house down. Yesterday, Housing Minister John Cowper made a bold statement to stop all evictions on NHC properties in the country. And unnecessary eviction for interests of other people must be stopped. And I have seen it from outside, so now as a minister responsible, I give directions so that there should be no more eviction for people who live in National Housing Corporation. The eviction happened four hours after the minister made his statement. The Heria family is now calling on political leaders and NHC to explain what has transpired. I appeal to the mayor and the elected member of Mosby Northwest because I am working with them too. If I can assist them, I appeal to the assistant member of the government and the governor powers back up too. The family is also urging Police Commissioner Gary Bucky to investigate the three policemen involved in this eviction. So this law, me like in Police Commissioner, I must investigate. Now, rouse him, this law, workman. Only not come in a right way. Where all... For now, the Heria family have decided not to leave the residence despite being locked outside. Jack Lepava, Jr., National MTV News. New Correctional Service Minister and Middle Fly MP Roy Biyama made his official visit to the CS headquarters yesterday. Minister Biyama's visit was to meet and greet CS Commissioner Michael Waipo and the senior management of the department. A key agenda Minister Biyama highlighted was to support and develop community corrective centers or the rural lockup facility. He reiterated that this will have prominence during his term as minister. Commissioner Waipo pledged to work with Minister Biyama and bring correct Correctional services to all levels of government. WIPO also discussed current issues of manpower shortage, maintenance of houses, and operational costs of maintaining institutions, among others. PNG could learn a thing or two about supporting local entrepreneurs by studying Japanese monetary systems. A recent lecture comparing the monetary systems of PNG and Japan revealed that the Japanese monetary system is more focused on supporting its small local businesses rather than on making big profits. The University of Papua New Guinea, in collaboration with the Embassy of Japan, recently presented the 2017 Vice-Chancellor's Lecture Series No. 3. 
Dr. Kiyotsugu Yashihara from the Kyoto University's Graduate School of Economics compared the PNG and Japanese monetary systems. Japan's ambassador to PNG, Satoshi Nakajima, said when Japan's economy was devastated in World War II, its now global companies like Honda and Sony were just small factories at the time, but they developed very rapidly with the help of the banking sector which supported the young entrepreneurs. I believe that today's lecture by Dr. Yoshihara will perfectly fit in the school's endeavor to that end. And hope that many of the audience here will get stimulus and encouragement for your future entrepreneurship. Dr. Yashihara shed light on how Japan was able to literally rise from the ashes after World War II. But he began by emphasizing that PNG has more natural wealth than Japan. You have uh, so many natural resources. We don't have. There isn't. You have uh, many oil. You have uh, many gold. You have uh, natural gas. We don't have. Dr. Yashihara said the key is supporting micro-sized enterprises and startup companies. He pointed out that Honda, Sony, and even Toyota all started as one-man companies. The development of MSME and the startup companies is an urgent issue of PNG. The society with large gap between the rich and the poor. So this is a big problem for your countries. He said Japan has localized banks that assist companies that are just starting up. In this way, they play a major role in growing the economy of the country. So we are always focused to small and SME because it is important to grow up to small and medium-sized enterprises. Ambassador Nakajima said in a complex and closely connected world, people-to-people -people ties and intellectual exchange like this seminar are important. Deli Waigeno, National, MTV News. In the news ahead, Milnbay Day celebrated for a cause. Details after the break. Welcome back. It was a fusion of traditional colors, dances, and a gathering of family and friends today at the Milne Bay Day celebrations in Port Moresby. The day was organized by the Milne Bay Day Organizing Committee, who was overwhelmed by the level of interest from participants in the nation's capital and from Alatau. The 2017 Milne Bay Day was held at the Sejong Guy Stadium with over 10 traditional dance groups from around the province performing. From uh, the Nomembi Island. The performances included those from the beautiful islands of love, Trobriand Islands, Misima Island, Duao Dancers, the fearsome Tawala, and more. Uh, the committee is a collaboration of, again mentioned earlier, the UPNG Milne Bay Students Union, as well as uh, volunteers, a handful of a few volunteers from the Milne Bay community in Port Moresby. Apart from upholding the Milne Bay spirit in the nation's capital, Milne Bay Day also aimed to unite Milne Bay families living scattered in and around the city. The aim of the day is also to raise vital funds for infrastructure for a school. In 2015, a group of Milne Bay students went down there to carry out awareness and found out that they still lack some. Um, infrastructures like building library and classrooms and as therefore we, we came up with the initiative of assisting the school this is just the first fundraising drive towards hosting the corporate dinner deputy prime minister and member for Alotau Charles Abel was also present today to pledge his support on behalf of his family, Minister Abel presented a donation of 5,000 kina towards the cause. Through this show, they've been uh, raising money for some of our schools. And I know this year that they're trying to raise the money for the Suwa or the James Chalmers Memorial High School. And there's no doubt that uh, James Chalmers Memorial High School needs a science lab. It needs a library. The event also aimed to give Mill Bay people a sense of pride through appreciating their identity by way of celebrating their traditional culture, food, dance, music, and friendship the Milne Bay way. Deli Waigeno, National, MTV News. 
efforts to increase the use of forest resources to boost local and national economies is a work in progress through the enhancing value-added wood processing in Papua New Guinea project. Stakeholders in Ley met at the Forest Research Institute where they were informed of the project's progress. Several partners of the Enhancing Value Added Wood Processing in PNG project met in lay after the project's midterm review. A workshop was held to inform stakeholders of the project's progress since it started in 2015. The project is funded by the Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research. It is aimed at increasing the contribution of forest resources to the economy and is coordinated by the PNG Forest Authority. The MOU has been signed between industry and us where when we, we should go to them and we work with the industry and develop the uh, products. The timber industry in the country continues to grow. With the existence of large-scale downstream operators, this research will assist small-scale local producers. This uh, program looks at uh, assisting the communities in terms of how they can well uh, produce their uh, forest produce uh, as uh, processed wood and then market those wood. Small scale producers still need to be educated about operations. That sort of uh, level of uh, production is not really uh, common so uh, that's why uh, such research is also useful to assist and promote uh, the uh, processes and procedures that can be utilized by the local. The project is still a work in progress. At the end of this project we will probably uh, be in a better position to uh, say whether we are successful with that, uh, achieving that aim or not. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. Four leaders of the opposition camp have criticized Police Commissioner Gary Baki over the late response of bringing in Prime Minister Peter O'Neill for questioning. The leaders described Mr. Baki's delayed response to the court's decision as deliberate. However, the Supreme Court has stayed the warrant of arrest against Prime Minister Peter O'Neill. Delayed tactic by the Police Commissioner. It is clearly a conflict of interest demonstrated by the police commissioner. He has compromised this office. I'm also calling on the Ombudsman Commission to intervene. If he has done nothing wrong, what well, defend yourself? That's what the court is there. And five years to this day, we haven't even taken the first step because of procrastinations the use of the system and abuse of the system to delay and fend it off. And it's taken five years, and we have not even crossed the taken the first step yet. Hela Governor Philip Undialu is urging people along the Nipa Porma Road to stop the unnecessary roadblocks following recent clashes in Mendi. Governor Undialu said Hela has nothing to do with current delays in the Southern Highlands regional seat counting. He also said the Hela provincial government is considering opening up the Magarima Kandep Road and the Hirilai Road. Governor Undialu said roads remain a vital link between Hela, Southern Highlands and Enga. Once again, let me call on the, um, uh, the people of Nipa and people of uh, Poroma. Uh, let us respect the rule of law, uh, stop intimidation and harassment and roadblocks on the road. Hella people has nothing to do with politics and we don't want to be victimized anymore. Uh, allow the traveling public and the industry to have access to the road. This road, is very, road corridor is very important for, not only for us but for people of Southern Island and the country. You're with National MTV News, stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Turning overseas, two trains collided in Egypt's coastal city of Alexandria on Friday, killing 42 people and injuring 133 others. An eyewitness said the two trains rose in the air, forming a pyramid when they collided. The collision, which occurred at 2.15 p.m. local time near Koshid Station at the edge of Alexandria, derailed the engine of one train and two cars of the other. 
President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi ordered an inquiry into the crash, which left bodies strewn on the ground as rescue teams worked to pull the dead and injured from the wrecked carriages and place them on blankets by the sides of the tracks amid farmland on the outskirts of the Mediterranean city. State television citing transport ministry officials reported that the crash was probably caused by a malfunction in one of the trains that brought it to a halt on the rails. The other train then crashed into it. However, a security source said without giving further details that a railroad switching era was the most likely cause. Egyptians have long complained that successive governments failed to enforce basic safeguards for the railways. A string of crashes have further inflamed public anger over the old-fashioned transport network. Friends and family of Australian woman Justine D Damon have remem remembered her life at a memorial service in the United States city of Minneapolis. It was a powerful and heartfelt ceremony for Justine Damon here at the Lake Harriet Banshell in Minneapolis. The home that Justine shared with her American fiancé Don is just about a mile from here and her friends have told me that she loved coming here for walks and that this was a special place to her. Her fiancé Don did speak and address the crowd and it was a very moving tribute to his fiancé. He said that they should have been on a plane together to Hawaii for their wedding, but they were here and he was going to use the occasion to profess his love for Justine. I really experienced love. I'm, I've never been married. I'm 50 years old this past year. Um, but I love at such a level, such a deep level. and. It felt like a privilege to love Justine. Justine Damon's father, John, also spoke, and you could feel the raw grief and anguish that's tearing at this family. Not only are they mourning their daughter, but they still don't have any answers from police about what happened. Her father said that she was killed by an agent of the state and that this should never have happened and spoke about the grief that's tearing him apart. I should have been on a plane to her wedding, but we were flying to her funeral. This is our first visit to Minneapolis. We should be walking arm in arm down the street, smiling and laughing. And now each step on the footpath is so very painful. Indigenous leaders are calling on Australia's Northern Territory and Fed governments to reject an application by a Dubai-based company to transport iron ore through one of the Gulf of Carpentaria's most pristine areas. The proposal is the most controversial part of a plan to revive a mine which collapsed because of the iron ore price slump. Indigenous leaders came to Darwin's Parliament House to open an exhibition celebrating their struggle to protect their country since explorer Ludwig Leichhardt trekked into it in 1845. Now they have a new fight on their hands. This document was a big surprise for me and I don't want to see it happen. Dubai-based Alrada Resources has lodged an application to reopen the failed Sherwin iron mine near the Roper River, 400 kilometres southeast of Darwin. It wants to build a barge port and bring ore down the river to ships waiting offshore near their sacred Maria Island. The island, river and tidal wetlands are habitat for endangered turtles and shorebirds. So when they're going to unload the iron ore to the big ship, the dust will flow. You know, the wind blows strongly in the, in the sea and it'll affect the island, it'll affect the birds, fish, turtle dugong. In its application, the company says an ore or fuel spill is unlikely, that the barge port construction won't disturb birds and reduced boat speeds will protect marine animals. It'll damage everything. It'll damage everything, and that's for sure. Our coastal areas. We just have to make sure that this proposal stays out of that area. If the mine goes ahead, the leaders want the ore taken out by road, as the former operator did. I'd rather the iron ore 
calls from the Javan mine up to here, Darwin. The Northern Territory government says the project will have to undergo a public environmental impact statement process. The company told the ABC that at this stage it doesn't want to answer environmental questions, but it's committed to being a good corporate citizen and building respectful stakeholder relationships. The economics will be another challenge. The Roper River ore would probably be uh, sold at somewhere like uh, $30 a tonne with an operating cost of $55 to $57 back in 2010, you'd have to suggest that the viability of the mine is probably, uh, at this point, nearly zero. The company wants to begin construction next year. Three men have been jailed for running a cannabis factory inside a former nuclear bunker in southwest England. All three admitted to conspiracy to produce drugs after several thousand cannabis plants with an estimated street value of $1.6 million was seized. Hidden beneath the wooded hills of Wiltshire, even today the bunker remains a secretive subterranean world. Its old antenna and air vents, the only sign of its existence. But five metres below ground, this Cold War sanctuary was transformed into a cannabis factory. 20 rooms that are baked. This was where 4,000 cannabis plants were found, spread over two floors. The men behind it were Martin Fillory, Playman Nguyen and Ross Winter who were jailed today for admitting conspiracy to produce the drug. Police say using the nuclear bunker, once owned by the Ministry of Defence, meant the gang could exploit its secrecy and security. This was a highly organised uh, operation and of course the nuclear bunker provided that level of security and covertness uh, to avoid uh, detection. This was the bunker as it was, a secret headquarters for regional government in the event of a nuclear war. 150 officials could survive here for a month. This was the canteen then. And when the police arrived, they found everything from a big screen TV to a fish tank. And all with the home comforts of an underground world where the underworld could go to ground. And look at all the wiring, there was a fire. The gang even bypassed the mains meter, ripping off £650,000 worth of electricity. All to keep the cannabis growing and drying around the clock. In fact, they thought this facility would provide them with the perfect cover for their illegal activities. Why? Well, first of all, you can't see it from the road. It's completely isolated and the complex itself can be locked up. They managed to keep this place a secret for three years. A place built for a bygone era of global world tensions, it ended up as an industrial scale cannabis production line, but one now consigned, like the Cold War itself, to history. Chugai Sports is next. Details after the break. Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The trainers workshop led by Donna Spethman from the Australian University Sports Association ended today at the Tarama Aquatic Centre. Students from tertiary institutions were tasked to carry out awareness programs to be leaders in their respective sporting fields. So hopefully people will take away a little bit more of a reflection on who they are as a person and when they're dealing with uh, people that they meet, both for the, the, the first time and people that they all know, currently know, is, is what they are as a person and their leadership qualities and being confident with who they are and, and understanding that everything that we do reflects on who we are. They are from educational institutions, there's also some students, um, people in coaching roles, so or they will be able to take this away and deliver the Be The Influence program to their students or their um, athletes or even their team members in a work environment and really reflect and understand that everything we do has an outcome 
and everything that they, we do as a person uh, reflects on our personal brand. And it, there's a saying that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So they don't buy what you do, so they don't know whether or not I'm a good person at X or Y, but they buy why I do it. If I'm enthusiastic and I'm passionate and I'm an honest person, then you know they're really good qualities in, uh, that we're looking for in, in leaders. To NRL, the Broncos have secured another big win over defending Premier's Cronulla Sharks. They beat the Sharks 32 points to 10 last night. Side to get us underway. It is the second time this season the Broncos have defeated the Sharks. Sharks captain Paul Gallen's 300 game celebration turned to tears as the Broncos raised 14 points to six at half time. So, Boyd will score! The Broncos have now scored 140 points in the past four games and are on a roll. Sharks' big name forwards Andrew Fifida, Wade Graham and Luke Lewis were stopped at the defence of the Broncos. Both of the Broncos' first half tries were a tribute to Cody Nicorima's pass selection. The Broncos were struck with a massive blow after Andrew McCullough was taken off the field after a suspected ligament injury. If the Roosters fall tonight to the Melbourne Storm, this would see the Broncos sit in second place on the Telstra Premiership ladder. Elijah Lavett, National MTV Sports. After becoming part of the International University Sports Federation, Papua New Guinea can now be able to participate in the World University Championships. FISU Regional Development Coordinator in PNG, Cornelius Papau, said PNG now has the challenge to be competitive on the world stage. As part of the International University Sports Federation, Oceania Regional Development Coordinator in PNG, Cornelius Papau is now working around the clock to conduct workshops to keep the university athletes abreast with the development in the sporting world. We are on Portmore Spain also within Papua New Guinea, especially the campus and universities and also tertiary institutions. The workshop will involve university students as well as other sporting enthusiasts to develop their leadership role under the banner of Be the Influence. Uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, Samoa, Samoa now has uh, come under the Fishing Ocean here, which purposely will work uh, in partnership also with the PNG University Sports Association to involve the students plus the, uh, the staff, university staff and other tertiary institutions also in activities and sporting events, uh, especially surrounding the, the university. The meeting will see some of the key speakers from the renowned universities in Australia delivering speeches to the participants. We have the, uh, on September 20, we have the International Day for University Sports, which is coming up uh, we're one month away from it. Our preparation is underway. We have the, our students will be taking part in, especially the women will be rugby nines. We will be playing rugby nines and the, and the men's going to be playing rugby sevens. So we have a good uh, a positive feedback from the board and the rugby union and the NRL PNG coming on board to support this, uh, the, the events. Organizing or participating in the World University Championship gives a city and often a university a chance to host an international major sporting event. Without being a big and rich city is what FISU Oceana and PNG is striving for in the near future. We have uh, events and uh, activities you know, around the world that is available for our students and you know, staff to attend. But uh, due to the couple of things within the, our office barriers, then we wanted to straighten out in that properly before we look at uh, sending our teams in university teams uh, to other countries. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. Trukai Sports continues when we come back. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Pro boxer Floyd Mayweather says his fight against Conor McGregor will not last that long. Both fighters have now tipped a knockout finish to the hotly anticipated bout between arguably one of the greatest boxers of all time and the explosive UFC champion. Floyd Mayweather has been studying his fierce UFC opponent Conor McGregor. If he's going, I'm saying that he, he believes that it's not going to go past four. And I believe that it's not going to go the distance at all. So he feels one way, I feel another way. We're both, uh, we're both confident in our skills and we'll just have to see. 
Conor McGregor, who has never boxed professionally, became the first UFC fighter to hold two belts simultaneously when he added the lightweight belt to the featherweight title he already held last November. Having scored two knockouts to win his belts, McGregor has confidently predicted he will floor Mayweather within four rounds to hand the American his first defeat in what will be his 50th professional bout. That's really, that's really, it's about doing your homework, you know, like even like the exam. It's not really watching fight tapes. It's really just knowing the person that you're facing that's across the ring from you. Uh, you want to know what that person likes to eat. You want to know what that person is doing when they're not, when they're not in training camp. You know, if they're, if they're drinking, how much they're drinking, who they're hanging out with. Those are the things that you want to know. That's called really doing your due diligence and your homework on the opponent, not just watching film and fighting. The bout is set to take place on the 26th of August in Las Vegas. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. Australian athlete Sally Pearson has qualified fastest for 100-meter hurdles final at the World Athletics Championships in London. Former Olympian Jane Fleming says Pearson looks to have returned to her career best form. The thing I really liked about her is towards the end of her race, which is not the strongest part of her race, she was pulling away from the field. Mm. And I think that's a really, really good sign. And London is her favourite place to run. Obviously, that's where she won her Olympic gold medal. And she's won, run so many races there in the past. But if you watch her, she gets her usual cracker of a start. But towards the end of the race is where she's looking really impressive. And that's what she'll need to do tomorrow in the final because it's going to be really a tough, tough final. But you can see there was daylight between her and the rest of the field as well so she's coming into her best form and I would say I would hesitate to say we'll wait to see tomorrow but she could run the best she's ever done. To AFL Western Sydney coach Leon Cameron described it as a terrific win and it could be one of the most important as well the Giants beating the Western Bulldogs by 48 points. With just two rounds left in the AFL, the win puts the Giants a step closer to a home qualifying final, while the Bulldogs could drop out of the top eight by the end of the weekend. Toby Green was reported again in his first game back from suspension. The forward's boot hit the face of Luke Dalhouse in the third term. Look, I understand there's going to be a lot of hysteria about Toby, you know. Um, but uh, clearly he has got his eyes on the ball and... Um, so, I mean, what he's done is he's protected himself um, and I'm never, ever, ever going to take it away from a player that keeps his eyes on the footy and uh, he's got his eyes firmly placed on the footy and these little unfortunate things happen in footy. To golf, Australian golfer Jason Day is in the hunt for a second major title. He sits two off the lead after the second round of the PGA Championships. American Kevin Kisner and Japan's Hideki Matsuyama lead the way at eight under par, while Australia's Mark Leishman and Adam Scott just scraped under the cut line. Day won golf's final major back in 2015 and moved into contention with a five under par second oh, round. But it was Matsuyama who was the big mover around the Quail Hollow course, shooting a 64 as he chases his first major title. And that ends Chukai Sports. The weather details when we come back. Chukai Sports. Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Looking at the weather forecast for this afternoon and tonight in the southern region, fine although sunny and cloudy at times in Port Moresby, fine although partly cloudy and windy in Daru and Alutau, a few showers in Kerma and fine although partly cloudy with chance of light showers in Popendeta. In the Mumasa region, fine although partly cloudy with a few showers inland in Leh, some showers, then cloudy in Medang, and thundery rain showers occurring, then cloudy in Wewak and Vanimal. In the New Guinea Islands region, thundery rain showers occurring, then cloudy in Larngau. 
Some showers then partly cloudy in Kaviang. Rain showers occurring then fine although partly cloudy in Kokopo and Rabaul. Few showers then fine although partly cloudy in Kimbe and fine although partly cloudy in Buka. And in the Highlands region, few showers then partly cloudy in Goroka and Kundiawa, then few rain showers although partly cloudy in Mendi, Tari and Wabeg. Strong wind warning for small ships for this afternoon and tonight. Strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of Papua New Guinea. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwa Island to Kerma, to Yul Island to Hood Point to Samurai Islands with waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Islands and waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Finchhafen through Vitia Strait, Dampia Strait including Siasi Islands to Long Island and waters of West New Britain seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands and waters of East New Britain to New Island to Bougainville seas of 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas for this afternoon and tonight. Coral Sea sees rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots with rain areas. Solomon Sea sees rough with southeast winds at 20 to 25 knots with gusts. Bismarck Sea sees rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots with gusts. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slight to moderate with southeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. And that's been National AMTV News this Saturday, the 12th of August 2017. From the entire news team, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>